الحمد لله الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجاعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم فملق التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم ذي الشرف الأشم والنور الأتم والكتاب المحكم وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيد ولد آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودعا لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم والعجم فالحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض وبما أنفقوا من أموالهم فالصالحات قانتات حافظات للغيب بما حفظ الله إلى آخر الآية رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين الله عز وجل when he sent uh, human beings on the earth uh, and sent both of our parents to the earth he said something remarkable because the devil was being sent down at the same time and he said ihbitu ba'dukum li ba'din adu all of you descend you are going to be enemies to each other which means the devil is going to be the enemy to men and women and he's going to make sure that men becomes become enemies to women and women become enemies to men and men to each other and women to each other so the idea is that he will try to create as much animosity as possible inna shaitan yanzu yanzu baynakum the shaitan is going to cause tension between you cause friction between you and since the beginning of humanity until today, human beings are suffering in their personal lives, in community, in countries, and in international politics with conflict. There are all kinds of conflicts that human beings are engaged in every single day. Some of our conflicts are economic. For example, an employee fighting with an employer. The boss says, you need to work more and get paid less. And the employee says, no, I want to work less and get paid more. You know, the boss says, less time off. The employee says, I want more time off. The government tells people, I want, we want more taxes. And people say we want to pay less taxes. The government says we want to provide less services. People say less taxes and more services. There's a tension between people and government and employers and employees. There's a tension between men and women in, in, in marriage and in social contracts and everything else. The rights between men and women. And in all of these conflicts, you know, every side believes that they're right. And, you know, for example, if there's a, if there's a divorce case or there's a conflict between a fam- you know, two family members and they go to a, a divorce court judge, if the judge is a man and the judge is a woman, it's going to make a difference, isn't it? Because they can't, they can't help but be who they are. And if the judge himself or herself went through a divorce just two months ago, then when they see, if the female judge sees the guy, she's not going to see a man, she's going to see her ex-husband and she's going to let it out. And you won't even know, because human beings can't help themselves but be biased. The same thing with a man. He'll have a bias against a woman, and he may not even be conscious of it. The thing though is that Allah Azza wa gave us guidance, and He gave us guidance because He loves men and He loves women equally. He's concerned with the employer and the employee equally. He's the only one that truly can be a neutral party. Nobody else can be neutral. Men can't be neutral. Women can't be neutral. You know, parents can't be neutral. Children can't be neutral. Children will say the parents have taken their rights. Parents will say children have taken their rights. Everybody is going to look at things from their own point of view. And what's interesting is our greed can be so, and our, our, our need to just get our rights and what we deserve. It's so obsessive that even when we come to our religion, what we do often is that we study the things that will benefit us. So parents will look up all the places in the Qur'an that talk about parents' rights so they can quote it to their kids and say, Allah says, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا 
Allah says, be the best you can be to your parents. Everybody wants to talk about their rights. Nobody wants to talk about their responsibilities. And then on the flip side, husbands will quote hadith and you know, ayat at their wives. And the wives will quote, oh, you're no sahabi yourself. And then they'll quote stuff at, at their husband. So everybody wants to take a part of Islam they can use as a weapon to slap somebody else with instead of taking responsibility themselves. The thing is, when we say, wa kalimatullahi hi al that the word of Allah is in the supreme place, it's in the highest place, then I have to put my needs and my wants and my bias and my feelings on the side and put Allah's word above that. And if, I, if I'm not able to do that, then I don't understand the place of Allah's word. Because my own bias and my own feelings are actually superior to Allah's own words. So today, it's a difficult subject. And I know by the time I give, end this khutbah, some people will be very upset. Um, and that's okay. Because I, and I'm not saying that what the, the values that I'm trying to share with you today, I live up to or I'm an example of them. We're all struggling to try to live up to the word of Allah. Right? So that's the, my first acknowledgement. That I'm not trying to portray myself as some sort of standard bearer. But the word of Allah is a mirror against, we all, we all have to look at ourselves against that mirror. And we have to see where we stand. And sometimes it's a difficult thing to look in the mirror and to face something that you don't want to look at, you know? So that's, I, I pray that the intention of this khutbah is accepted for the good that it's meant for. And that is that you and I learn to look at ourselves, not somebody else. You know, a lot of times when I give a khutbah like this one, people are like, hey, I wish my, my, my wife was here listening to this. Or I wish my husband was here listening to this. Well, no, no, no. You, how about you listen? How about don't worry about somebody else who needs to listen? Because in our head, somebody else needed to hear this, but we're good already. And you know, we, we tell ourselves, yeah, 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 I do all that. Yeah, thanks for the reminder, but I, I'm already good. I, I got 100% on this. Other people need this advice really badly. That kind of self-righteousness and that delusion that this doesn't apply to me or this doesn't apply to you, that's dangerous. لا تزكوا أنفسكم Allah says, don't consider yourselves pure. Like you don't need help, you don't need advice, or this advice is already something you're living up to. Don't do that to yourself. He knows better who's actually conscious of Allah. Not you, not even myself. I can't even give that scorecard to myself. That belongs with Allah Himself. So this ayah is one of the most famous, and also the end of this ayah is a big controversy in, you know, in Quran studies, and sociology circles, etc. Because this is the famous ayah in which men may be allowed to hit women. Right, that's the end of this ayah. And I've talked about that concluding part of the ayah in many different lectures. But actually my khutbah today is not about that portion of the ayah. It's about the beginning of this ayah. And in the beginning of this ayah, Allah opens his statement by saying, Arrijalu qawamuna ala nisa. Men are caretakers over women. Men are caretakers over women. The word qawam has several meanings. And the first of its meanings, qawmatul insan is husnu tulihi aw thabatuhu. Like it's, uh, the word qawam means they are a source of stability for women. That's one of its first meanings. That men provide stability for women. Men are a way by which they are protected. Men why, uh, protected not just physically or financially, but also emotionally protected. So they're a, a place of security for them. And then, Qama yaf'alu kada, when, when somebody's committed to doing something, then the, the verb qama is used. When they've made up their mind and they're going to do something. Meaning men are committed to the care of women. Men are charged with the responsibility to protect and care for women. Then Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, in, in the use of this word, it's remarkable that this word, we have to understand that it's sacred. Because from the same letters, qaf, waw, and meme, actually one of the other names of Allah derived from this word is Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum qayyum and Allah describes himself in the Quran as qa'iman bil qist qa'iman bil qist which is from the same origin so Allah has used a word for men that is actually it has some of the attributes that Allah uses for himself so we have to understand what that means when Allah calls himself al-qayyum he's saying he's the one tadbir He's the one who plans things out and lays out an entire sequence of events for the, 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 his creation, and to ensure that they're growing and to ensure that they're provided for. Meaning, when men become qawam, they're doing their very best to have an actual plan for the, the, the women in their, in, their, you know, in their wing, in their households. You know, another place in the Quran, Allah describes married men as muhsineen. With a sad, not with a seen, with a sad, muhsinin. That's actually the same surah. 
And that actually means to bring women inside of a fort. Meaning, a fort is a symbol of protection, isn't it? And so if a, if you, once you get married, she's entered your fort. She's protected from all sides. She's protected from everything else. And a, and a fort is self-sustained. The food is provided for, protection is provided for, shelter is provided for, everything's taken care of. And that's the idea of a muhsin. And a woman, interestingly enough, are described as muhsanat. Women that are inside of the forts. Meaning they don't like to go out of the fort too. They, they want to stay within that fort. And they're described as someone who accepts that role that the husband is playing. In any case, Allah then says, بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ And this responsibility of being in charge of the care and the needs and the protection uh, you know, for women, this responsibility comes on account of the fact that Allah decided that some will have preference over others. Now this is important language. Allah didn't say, بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُمُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِنَّ he said, بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ Because Allah has given some preference over others. You know what that means? That means in some things, men have a preference. Allah has given them an advantage over women. And in other things, Allah has given women an advantage over men. Men have to take certain responsibilities. If they're going to be the caretaker or the, you know, the provider and you know, the protector and all of those responsibilities, that's actually a privilege Allah has handed over to women. You're not responsible for any of those things. And so Allah then opens it even further and then talks to the men and says, وَبِمَا أَنفَقُوا مِنَ أَمْوَالِهِمْ And that's because of what they have to spend from their monies. Now herein lies the key. Allah in the Qur'an did not talk exhaustively about marriage. Like he didn't describe all the things that make a marriage work. There are very few places in the Quran where Allah gave us some insights. And basically it's like instead of describing the entire building, he mentioned a few pillars. If those pillars are not there, the building's going to collapse. Right? And one of those pillars is that the money responsibility is the man's responsibility. He better go find a job. He better go get some work. He better go and provide because that is actually what Allah has made him responsible for. The word qawwam in the beginning is now being explained by the fact that men are financially responsible for the groceries, for the car, for the fuel, for the electricity bill, for the school, you know, school supplies for the kids, everything. Everything. And that starts from the very beginning when you get married, you take the responsibility of paying a mahar, a dowry. Right? And some people, they, they love to have a high number for the dowry for their daughter. They say it's going to be 100,000 or 50,000 or 250,000 or whatever. They put this crazy number. And they're like, no, 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 it's okay. You don't have to pay it now. It's okay. But mashallah, we, we should have a number that looks good. And then people are married for 20 years and the guy hasn't paid his dowry. That's ridiculous. Because this is a condition of making a marriage valid. You can't put that off. You can't just keep kicking the can down the road. And a husband isn't even allowed to say to his wife, Hey, by the way, can you give me a discount? I know you put 50, can we take a few zeros off of that? Or how about I give it to you, not dollars, can I give it to you in rupees? Same number. You know, <laughs> you know I'll give you in you know, Zimbabwean currency or something. I'll give you some other currency that, you know, because, you know, come on, just go easy. I, I have a hard life, look at all the things I'm doing. Can you just go, if you agreed to it, then you signed on. If you didn't want to agree to it, then you should have never signed that document. You're actually not even allowed to hint that you have trouble paying your mahar. Men aren't even allowed to hint at that. فَإِن طِبْنَ لَكُمْ عَن نَفْسٍ مِّنْهُ شَيْئًا And after you pay the dowry, like if, you, if you're a monthly payments you're making, you give her like $500 or something, 100 bucks, whatever you give her, that's part of your dowry that you're paying off. And you pay her and you're like, fine, here's, here's your monthly... <laughs> You know, this week was really tough. This month was... You can't make none of those comments. And if she takes those hundred dollars from you, and then she takes out a dollar bill and says, here, go get yourself some ice cream. If she does that, then, and you say, okay, thanks, you can take that, if she did it on her own. But once you're handing that money, you're not even looking at that money anymore. It ain't yours. That's part of being a man, according to the Qur'an. It's part of being rijal qawamun, ala nisa so you know when, and the reason I was kind of, one of the reasons I was uh, uh, pushed to give this lecture is because lots of people email me all kinds of questions. And there are many men around the world whose wives are being told to go get a job and work while they're sitting at home. Muslim men. And they're saying, you have to obey your husband. What kind of ridiculous, what religion is that? Allah Azza wa made men responsible financially. 
And they can't even say, you have to go and we, we're having a hard time, you need to earn this or that. Look, if there's a desperate situation and a wife decides to go get a job and support financially or do on her own, that's a voluntary thing she's doing that she cannot be told to do. And if she does that, if she does get a job, if she does have a business, if her father left behind some stores or some property in her name, and you're like, hey, can, can we get some of that too? Because I'm your family. No, 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 that's her money. You can't touch it. Allah made this equation in which she has a financial advantage, meaning your money is basically hers. And her money is hers. And you can't look at it. You can't keep your eye on it. You can't say, whatever happened to that? What happened to that jewelry? What happened to that? No, 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 that's not yours to touch. That's not yours to touch. And whatever you gave her, like you say, hey, you know, on our 10th anniversary, I'm going to give you this car. That you know, once you gave her the car, it's her car. It's her, you can't even take the keys and say, I'm going. No, you got to get her permission. And she better give it on her own good free will. No pressure, not even unspoken pressure that you can touch that car. Because you gave it up, it's done. It's done. وَآتُ النِّسَاءَ صَدُقَاتِ هِنَّ نِحْلَةً Give women their gifts happily and freely. Don't, you don't even think about them again. Don't even think about them again. So this, this financial sense that men are supposed to have is critical. And Allah mentions that as one of the first conditions of what makes a marriage work. What, make, what makes them men. الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض وبما أنفقوا من أموالهم. When they take that kind of responsibility, where the wife doesn't have to ask, hey, we don't have food for groceries, we don't have, we don't have money for groceries, we don't have this. Oh, I gotta give you again. You know, and for a lot of men, you know what they do? They feel that they owe financial responsibility or financial help to their brother, okay, to their sister, to their mother and their father who may be financially already taken care of, but you still want to give them, but you're not giving financial needs to your wife and your children. That's not being a man. That's not being a man. And some people are in financial abuse situations where <clears throat> I've even seen cases where the bank account is a joint account between the, the husband, the, the, the man, and his mother. And the wife has no access to the account. What kind of, what Islam did you learn? Where did you get this from? And the wife is being constantly told, by the way, that's our son. It's like, that's our property, you're just renting it. <laughs> you know? This is what, what the wife is being told. If you wanted to act that way, then you, should, you had no business getting married. If you wanted to treat, financially treat the spouse this way, then you have no business being in the institution of marriage. This is the first and foremost principle. You know, there are people who give mahar, they give marriage gifts, or even at the wedding ceremony, they give lots of presents, and then a couple of days later, the guy's family says, hey, can we have those back? We need them for, for our daughter's wedding. <laughs> Once you give it up, you've given it up. It's done with. Now let's flip to the other. And the sisters that are listening to this right now are like, yeah, finally a khutbah about team ladies. Well, you know, Allah is, I told you in the beginning, Allah is fair. There's a balanced equation. Allah loves both sides, men and women. Allah told the men what responsibilities they have. The rest of this, the khutbah is actually the other side. What is, what are the, okay, so men are responsible for all of this, and they better, you know, drip their sweat, and break their backs, earning for a family, and go through all of the labor that, that they need to go through to take care of them, and provide for them, and protect them, and take care of them emotionally, and financially, and physically, and all of those things. Well, what do the women owe then? What, what's their side of this equation? Well, Allah Azza wa starts with, not, you, you know, He said, men take care of women. And you were expecting that Allah will say, women, therefore do this. Right? But instead of saying women, he said, فَالصَّالِحَاتِ then, then as a result, therefore, good women, good women, he doesn't even say women, he says, good women, as if Allah expects the first thing for women to be is good. Not, not even women anymore. You must be good. And what does good mean in Arabic? The word salih comes from sulh. Sulh means the opposite of fighting, the opposite of corruption. Actually, when there's a conflict, then you want to make peace between two sides, you do sulh. Meaning, women are the source, the, such wives are the source of ending all conflicts in the family. They are a source of peace and reconciliation. They are the reason tempers go down. They are the reason voices are lowered. They are the reason, they are the source of calm. They are the voice of reason. They're the source of reform. If there is a conflict or some kind of tension, the first place that the husband looks to, where th when he turns to her, things are going to settle down, is going to be the wife. For some of you are like, seriously? Because 
all the fighting is actually... You're, you're telling me that the place where all the fighting starts for, from is the place where it's supposed to end? Because I don't have any other raised voices in my house except hers. And nobody else is angry in my house except her. So the guy is kind of... The, the men don't take care of their end, and women don't take care of their end. And they become a source of great tension and conflict. Allah starts by saying that they are a source of reform. They are settled, they are calm, they are actually peace themselves, goodness themselves. They are the removal of all sorts of tension. That's the first quality. Then he says, qanitatun, eager to obey. And some have interpreted this as eager to obey Allah. And that is true. They are eager to obey Allah. You know, they, they translate this as subservient. Like, al-qunutu lillah. That qunut belongs to lillah. And Allah says, qumu lillahi qanitin. Meaning, have qunut, meaning have this kind of eagerness to obey only for the sake of Allah. But what, is, what in the world does that mean? That means, what's that doing here? Because you know, if one side was men should do this for women. You expect the rest of it to be, women should do this for men. So why in the middle of that is Allah saying, yeah, they should do this for men, but this part is for Allah. Well, the reason that's there is because women should remember that when they are being a source of calm, and when they are providing peace and sakina in the household, they, re- they need to realize the only one who can keep a, keep a household calm is them. And the only one who can truly set it on fire is them. They control the emotional, like you know you, in your home you have an air conditioner control that controls the temperature. Women control the emotional temperature of a household. They control it. And they better keep it cool because this is an act of them obeying Allah Himself. This is out of their eagerness to obey Allah. They need to become a source of calm. You know, and they both need to do that. Because men are taking care of them, and they're being calm in return. You know, for some people, what happens in, in abusive, emotionally abusive relationships, one person's constantly saying, calm down, calm down, it's okay, it's okay, don't be angry, don't be angry. And the more you say that, the other person's like, no! Don't talk to me! Leave me alone! Etc, etc. So one person has to be upset. One of them, it's either the guy who's upset and she's trying to calm him down, or she's upset and he's trying to calm her down, and they see that as a source of kind of control or power. Like, yeah, I got him now. If I calm down now, I don't get that many points. Let me get some more juice out of this, you know? So I'm going to keep this anger thing going. Just see how far I can take it. So this kind of putting someone in a subservient position, this is against what Allah Azza wa Jal wants. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, qanitatun. Then he adds something, another responsibility for women. He says, حَافِظَاتٌ لِلْغَيْبِ They guard what is, un, what is invisible. They guard the invisible. What does that mean? It means that when the husband's out at work. They're not doing anything the husband wouldn't have wanted them to do. They're not talking to anybody who the, who the husband wouldn't have wanted them to talk to. They don't have any friends that the husband didn't approve of. They're not having any conversations that are behind his back. Conversations that are private between husband and wife are not being shared with her mother or her sister or whoever else because they're supposed to guard that. There's, some, there's a privacy between a husband and a wife. And just because you're having a... Con- now if there's an abuse situation and he's beating you or he's cussing you or he's doing some crazy things to you, then you need to get somebody who can actually help. Not just somebody to talk to, but somebody who can come in and intervene. That's talked about in the surah later on. But when it becomes a habit, I just need to talk to somebody, and you're just railing on the husband, or you're sharing things that he asked you to keep private, or he, you're, you're doing, you have connections, or friends, or associates, or company, or you're going to places where he would never have wanted you to go to. Had, you see, had he seen you there, he would have been really upset or really hurt. And you're still doing that anyway. And in your head, well, he didn't find out, so it's okay. Allah says, حَافِظَاتٌ لِلْغَيْبِ They have to guard what is invisible, meaning part of the meaning is what is invisible to him. They have to guard that. بِمَا حَفِظَ اللَّهِ Because of what Allah ordained should be guarded. You see, now the, the equation is balanced. On the one side, Allah Azza wa Jal told men, you have to spend because Allah has put that responsibility on you. بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ وَبِمَا أَنفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ On the other side, حَافِظَاتٌ لِلْغَيْبِ بِمَا حَفِظَ اللَّهِ They have to guard what is in the unseen because of what Allah has decided to guard. So they're not supposed to be keeping secrets from their husband. They're not supposed to be having, you know, you know, passwords on their phone and the husband says, can I see your phone? No. Why? I don't, no. Hold on a second, let me erase everything. Okay, now you can see it. Why? There should be, the, the, the only one you can keep, the, un, you know, the, the private life of a wife is actually completely shared. You are their libas, they are your libas. There are no secrets between husband and wife. 
They're supposed to be completely open with each other. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would share secrets with his wives. With asarra al-nabiyu ila ba'di azwajihi haditha. When he shared a secret with his spouse. In his most private and most difficult moments, he turned to her. If you can't be each other's clothes, you know when somebody's wearing clothes, there's nothing between the clothes and your body, is there? Your clothes, the inside of your clothes have no secrets between you and, and your, yourself and them. That's the description of a spouse, a husband and a wife. So when you're not able to guard that, and what is meant to be just for the husband, and what is meant to be just for the wife is going somewhere else, then that's a violation of what women are supposed to do. And this is the, these are just few things that Allah mentions, that this is actually how the, the balance is maintained between the two sides. الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض وبما أنفقوا من أموالهم And on the other hand, فالصالحات قانتات حافظات للغيب بما حفظ الله I know that I'm going to put this on social media, you know what's going to happen, but what about this? What about this? What about this? What, about, what if he's crazy? What if, he's, what if she does this? What if she does that? Everybody's concerned about the abuse from the other side. And if there is abuse, it's real. I acknowledge that it's real. But you, the, the, what I wanted to elaborate first and foremost is, how does Allah expect things to look? Not I expect, or you expect. How does Allah expect the relationship to look? What are some of its most fundamental pillars? That if they are not there, then they should be the first priority before anything else. Before we fix, you know, marriage can have a hundred problems. A family can have a hundred problems. If these few things that I've mentioned are still a problem, then everything else is secondary, this is the primary. This is the real issue. So this has to be worked on before anything else. And if this is not being resolved, this cannot be fixed, then what does Allah say? فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ شِقَاقَ بَيْنِهِمَا فَبْعَثُوا حَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا If you really think that this is a schism, like a canyon has opened up between them, and they can't seem to figure out how to make this work, these, these fundamentals aren't there, then you need to get someone counsel, worthy of counsel, some wise person, some sensible person that can represent her side, her from her family, and get somebody representative from his family and get them to talk it out. Nobody else should get involved. Nobody, this, is not a, this is not a dinner conversation. This is not some interesting subject at an Eid party. You know, those two are having trouble. This is not for anybody else. This is one responsible person who cares, who understands things, and is not emotionally all over the place, not an angry person from her family, one calm, level-headed person from his family, and they can have a, you know, a mutual meeting to try to figure things out. If things work out, okay. If, if, if things don't work out, that's okay too. That's okay. This is how things are supposed to be solved. This is how hatred is not created. And you know what happens a lot of times? People remain in broken marriages and they don't get anybody involved, and they don't fix what's broken, and they develop hatred towards each other. And then they, when that hatred is towards between husband and wife, the children see it. And they learn that this is normal. It's normal for mom and dad to talk this way. So when they, those kids grow up, and they're going to be married, guess how they're going to talk to their spouse? That's what they learned. That's the schooling they got at home. So when you don't have that peace at home, you are actually passing that chaos down to the next generations. And, you, and it's a subconscious kind of learning. You know, when, when children learn from what they see, that is never forgotten. What they learn in classroom, you forget. You, you, you know, you guys, when you were kids, you don't remember what your teacher said in the class. You remember one thing, what your, what your parents used to do at home, you remember. You remember that. You still, as adults, you remember that. Because that, that leaves an imprint on a person's personality. So this isn't just about even a husband and a wife. It's about the legacy we're leaving behind. The, the, you know, the, the, the tranquility that's supposed to come thereafter. I genuinely pray that those of you that are married, husbands and wives, are able to really look at themselves and recognize whether or not they're fulfilling their responsibilities as Allah wants them to. And I genuinely hope if you are, if you do find yourself in a very difficult marriage situation, that you're able to find somebody to confide in from your side, from your family. And if there's nobody reasonable in your family, because that happens sometimes, maybe all y'all crazy, that happens, you know, everybody's crazy, then you have to find somebody who can at least represent your side reasonably and speak on your behalf. Because if you keep suffering from abuse silently, then you are actually, you're part, partly responsible for what's happening. And not just to you, what's happening to your children or future generations. Right? And it, but it, because it's not okay to live in resentment with somebody else. It's not okay to look at somebody else and remember all the hurt they caused you all the time. It's not okay to not be at peace. The fundamental purpose of marriage was لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Before Allah mentioned love, before He mentioned care, mawadda wa rahmah, He said the first purpose of marriage is so you can find peace with each other. 
When you look at someone, you just calm down and relax. Like finally I'm in a safe place. Finally this is a place where I'll be dignified, I won't be humiliated, I won't be reminded of my past mistakes, I won't be, I'm completely at ease because I'm in the presence of my spouse, husband or wife. If that's not there, then that needs to be there. And if that's not, if you're not able to get there yourself, then you need outside help and professional help at that. May Allah Azza wa allow us the, the opportunity to fix broken relationships and to do what's best for ourselves and our families. May Allah Azza wa allow us and give us the risk of seeking the right kind of help to mend the ties that are being broken. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhin astafa khususan ala afdalihim wa khatam in nabiyin محمدٍ الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا